Welcome to the Hippodrome of Alexandria. The main Hippodrome of the city was called the Legaeon, in honor of Lagos, the ancestor of the Ptolemies. Alexandrians were great lovers of horse racing. They were fascinated by the rivalry of these races. The Agon, as it was said at that time, that every competition brought. It was a struggle for glory. The most important chariot race was the Tethrapon. Using four horses with the quickest harness to the front right, the charioteer would race for 12 laps with sharp turns at either end of the hippodrome. The victors were crowned with garlands of olive and received prize money, but the most sought after reward was to be acclaimed by the works of poets such as Callimachus and Pindar. Ye hymns that rule the lyre, what god, what hero, I, and what man shall we loudly praise? Verily Zeus is the lord of Pisa, and Heracles established the Olympic festival, while Theron must be proclaimed by reason of his victorious chariot with its four horses, Theron who is just in his regard for guests, and who is the bulwark of Akragas, the choicest flower of an auspicious line of sires, whose city towers on high, bringing wealth and glory to crown their native merits. <laughs> Welcome to Wine in Ancient Egypt. When the god Horus lost his eye in a war with Seth, the ancient Egyptians believed the eye turned into a vine and the vine's tears became wine. Early texts dating back to 3150 BCE contain the hieroglyph for vine. Regarded as extremely valuable, wine was highly sought after by the elite. It was also an essential part of many religious ceremonies. A millennia old tradition, grape cultivation and wine production was regimented in the way typical of ancient Egyptian bureaucracy. Egyptians kept careful records of winemakers, which they clearly identified on labels. Every landowner with a modicum of self-respect usually kept a vineyard. This held particularly true in the regions of the Fayum and the Nile Delta. Mm. 
documentation shows that only certain craftsfolk were allowed to provide the containers required to store and transport wine. That and rigorous quality control checks established for every step of wine production shows that ancient Egyptians knew that the quality and longevity of wine could easily be affected by any number of variables, which they paid careful attention to. Egyptians had different kinds of wines, most of which ranged in quality from good to very good. The sweet Shade, to which honey had been added. The soft Nejem, obtained by drying the grapes in the sun. The Ma, reserved for religious ceremonies. And finally, there was the Peor, the mediocre rated wine, resulting from the second pressing of grapes and reserved for a less discerning palate. Oh, no. 
Try using your ego when you want a top-down view. Welcome to Ancient Egyptian Cultivation. The new grain types of the Ptolemaic period required a great deal of water. Farmers needed to ensure they had effective, consistent irrigation. The Nile's rising and receding waters naturally irrigated most of the crops. Areas where the Nile didn't reach, such as gardens and vegetable plots, required an irrigation tool known as the shadoof. The shadoof allowed easy transport of water from its source. It consisted of a tall wooden frame with a long pivoting pole and suspended bucket. The system could be raised and lowered with little effort. Later, a sakya, or water wheel, was invented. The sakya needed animals to turn the wheel, which rotated buckets through the water. It drew the water to an elevation of 3.5 meters and enabled a great deal of control over the irrigation process. This improvement supplied larger areas and thus resulted in larger harvests. The threshing process separated the grain from its husk. Workers would spread the ears on clean ground. Oxen, cows, or donkeys were then guided back and forth to trample the grain. This continuous movement worked the grain loose while preventing the animals from eating it. Unwanted chaff and straw were swept away or gathered and added to the mud used to make bricks to make them stronger. 
winnowing was the stage where workers used wooden scoops to throw ears in the air. The wind carried off the chaff, leaving the heavier seeds to fall to the ground. This action was repeated until the undesired materials were sifted out. Grain waste was mixed with manure or other organic substances to produce brick-shaped dung loaves that could be easily burned. A standardized brick size enabled Egyptians to mass produce this byproduct and use it as a commodity. Transporting large amounts of grain required ships equipped to carry heavy loads. These goods were moved during the Nile's flooding season, when the river was deep enough for large ships. The transports stopped at checkpoints to accommodate customs and police controls, as well as for technical requirements and weather conditions. Having reached Alexandria's inner harbor, the wheat was unloaded under the supervision of a civil servant in charge of wheat management. Portions were distributed to Alexandria's city market, and the remaining stockpile was either exported or stored in warehouses. Grain storage facilities were located across all of Egypt. Temples and institutions had large silos, while individual houses had storage sheds. In some houses, arched cellars were built into the foundations. These watertight chambers were accessible from the ground floor through a trap door. Royal granaries acted as the storehouse and distribution centers and managed state payments to civil servants soldiers and the police. Though plastered on the inside, silos weren't completely sealed and so remained susceptible to mice infestations. <laughs> when the grain was ready for processing, it was poured into bowls and pounded into a coarse flour. That flour was then passed through a sieve to make it of finer quality and further ground between stones. Ancient Egyptians did not stock flour. Instead, fresh grain was portioned out each time to produce flour as it was needed. The sieves used by ancient Egyptians were unable to filter out sand and stones. Grit often passed into the flour causing long-term tooth abrasions among all classes of Egyptians.
Welcome to Jean-Francois Champollion. Between the 5th century CE and the Renaissance, knowledge of hieroglyphs was entirely lost. Many enthusiasts tackled the challenge of deciphering the language with little success. Some groundwork was made with various researchers identifying names and some grammatical structure and confirming that cartouches were markers for royal names. They were still missing a critical piece of information that would eventually be revealed thanks to the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was found in 1799 by Bouchard, a soldier in Napoleon's army. The stele dates from 196 BCE, written in ancient Egyptian and Greek with three scripts, hieroglyphics, demotic, and Greek alphabet. Following the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte in 1801, the English took possession of the stone. It has been at the British Museum since 1802 and remains the most visited object of the museum to date. The first translation was of the Greek section only in 1803 it detailed a decree of Pharaoh Ptolemy V, reminding the citizens that their Pharaoh had led Egypt to prosperity. It was fully translated 20 years after by Jean-Francois Champollion, who was working with a facsimile. Through his studies of the stone, Champollion was able to make a critical observation that would unlock the whole mystery, that hieroglyphics were not only ideograms, but also phonograms. Hieroglyphs consist of phonetic glyphs, single characters, and logograms. Essentially, they are a combination of phonetics, alphabet, and full words, which in total form a language. While studying the stone, Champollion realized that there was a difference in the number of hieroglyphic characters in relation to the number of Greek characters for the same word. This led him to believe that hieroglyphs must have phonetic characteristics. This was the first step to unlocking the Rosetta Stone's secrets. To prove this theory, Champollion began identifying Egyptian rulers' names and then compared their phonetic pronunciation to the Greek version. For example, Cheops had been the Greek name given by ancient chroniclers to the owner of the Great Pyramid, Khufu. The next step for Champollion was to confirm that his approach was verifiable by using the Philae obelisk as an additional reference. Engraved in the obelisk are two inscriptions in Egyptian hieroglyphs and Greek. Once he confirmed the names of Ptolemy and Cleopatra within these texts and confirmed the same phonetic patterns as on the Rosetta Stone, Champollion knew he was on the right track. Champollion had already mastered several ancient languages when he took on deciphering the Rosetta Stone. He used his knowledge of Coptic to identify the solar disk hieroglyph on the obelisk as the phonetic translation of Ra. Further translation only strengthened his conclusion. Egyptian hieroglyphs encompass the alphabet in both phonetics and determinative ways, which means that the symbol represents the word itself. Mm -hmm. 